watching Meet the Candidates, uh, Brockton Community Access's show about candidates running for election in any of the different campaigns that we have going on. And today we are honored to have our state auditor for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts here, Suzanne Bump. Suzanne, welcome to Brockton. Thanks. Nice, nice to, to see be you. back. Thanks. You are someone that is familiar with this area because you grew up in this area, correct? Exactly. I grew up in the town of Whitman, went to Cardinal Spellman High School, and I still have two sisters uh, living in Brockton uh, while my mother is still in Whitman. So I'm here pretty frequently. Well, there you go. Um, and I remember going back to the day that uh, you were sworn in, you chose to do it at Cardinal Spellman High School, your alma mater. That's right. The school has a lot of meaning for me, not just uh, sort of in a, in a personal way, but it also was important in how I viewed the world and my role in it and why I actually ultimately got involved with politics and government in the first place. Because I knew that somehow um, I needed to be of service to others. And I also knew I wasn't going to be a nurse and I wasn't going to be a social worker and government was what attracted me because I feel that it's a way of uh, changing society, improving uh, society, creating opportunity for mm -hmm. others. So it was that set of values that they helped um, me see could be turned into really a life's work. Well, I got to tell you, I think it was the least ostentatious ceremony that I saw. It was very warm and very friendly, and I know they loved having it there. I, yeah, it we, I enjoyed it. I've gone to a lot of swearing-ins, and it yeah. wasn't stuffy. It was it was just down to earth, and it was nice that you chose to do that. I want to tell you that. Well, thank you. Well, and the joyous voices of the choir, uh, the, the chorus at, uh, at Cardinal Spellman, was, uh, that, that certainly added uh, immeasurably to it. Well, we work with them all the time, and we cover some of the sports and uh, they just put together a, a, a partnership with uh, you know where they work with Trinity Catholic and uh, yeah. Stonehill and it all kind of ties together uh, we actually got to cover an event there for uh, when Andrew Card came to speak to the students a student said was doing a project for a class and he wanted to know something about the chief of staff job no no he wasn't he didn't Skype in he yeah. flew in and oh, he went great. to the school and we recorded it and it was very down to earth I had worked with him I had run the Holbrook Television Studio at one point, so I knew him when he was a state rep back in the day. Well, I'll tell you something, and that is that I got my introduction to state government and state level politics through Andy Card. I volunteered on his campaign back in Early 78, yeah. 78 yeah. Uh, yeah. when they cut the size of the house from 240 to 160 members, his district changed. He was picking up the town of Whitman. I got involved with the campaign. I went into the office as, a, as an intern. Um, from there, I met a state representative, and that was my career. I uh, started my career, actually, at the, uh, at the state house. Now, you were the state representative for Braintree, correct? Yes, I did that for, uh, after six years of being a legislative aide. Uh, my, uh, my employer, my state representative, Elizabeth Mateer, uh, decided to retire. Um, I hadn't intended to run for office, uh, but I, I really felt strongly about uh, the, the needs of the community and how a state representative could, uh, could help fill those needs, and so I decided to, uh, to run. I did so successfully. I was there for eight years. Before then, I went into the private sector as, uh, as an attorney and sat on a number of, uh, of boards, including the Edwina Martin House uh, here in, uh, in Brockton, when they were going to close that down. Well, maybe it was a dozen years ago now when Catholic Charities was going to pull out. Uh, I was among a group of women who said, we can't let this happen. We need this recovery program for women on the South Shore and uh, made sure that it stayed open by getting the license from the state and the, and the contract as well. And, uh, and the Edwina Martin House is thriving and just opened a, uh, a three-quarter house just down the street on mm -hmm. North Main Street too. So it's, it's, it's been great. Now, your legislative experience, um, what go back to those days. What, sure. what committees were you on, and did it lead you down the path to where you are now? Uh, yes, is, the answer to the short answer is yes. Um, I sat for uh, six of my years, uh, six of the eight years, on the Committee on Transportation, mm -hmm. uh, and I was the vice chair of that committee for two years. Uh, and then for my last two years, I'd also sat during those years on the Committee on Commerce and Labor, and I chaired the Committee of Commerce on Commerce and Labor. And um, 
it was there that the seeds were first planted um, uh, for my uh, interest in not just policy, but on how you turn ideas and goals into government structures that work. So I, I, a quick explanation of what I mean is that when I was there, so I was a state rep from 1984 until 1993, and the workers' compensation system was on the verge of collapse. There were huge case backlogs. It was wildly expensive for employers. Uh, it, 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 the system simply wasn't serving anyone. Judges weren't writing decisions uh, in a timely manner, and uh, so it was. It was a. It was a big mess, and it needed to be restructured. And I was in charge of that restructuring. And to get in there and really understand what the dynamics are, and and to find root causes for problems in government. Why aren't things working? Why aren't people being held accountable? That's the work that I did, not just with the workers' compensation system at that time but also with the unemployment um, system. And so when many years later, specifically in 2007, when Deval Patrick was elected governor and he invited me to join his cabinet as the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development, um, I was able to bring all of that insight that I had uh, uh, and those analytic capabilities, which were even improved, of course, when I was out in the, in the private sector, uh, to bear on a wide range of agencies. Uh, so as Secretary of Labor, I had, uh, I had six agencies, 1,500 employees, uh, workers' compensation, unemployment were part of it, but so was skills training. Mm -hmm. you know, skills training is a necessary element of how we grow our economy. You can't do it without an educated workforce. Uh, you, we know in Brockton, because of the loss of so many traditional indus industries, uh, particularly the shoe, uh, the shoe industry, how, uh, how vital it is that we have programs that can help folks acquire skills for the new economy. And so that's the work that I did for Deval. But it was all based on that ability to get in and you know, get to the nuts and bolts uh, uh, that I started when I, was, uh, when I was a state legislator. And it leads you to oversight of making sure government is accountable. Right. Being an auditor, um, it, 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 it does, it's not specifically, okay, we, we, we're checking out every single little number, but we're seeing if state government works, if it's efficient. Right. If I remember the themes of your campaign when you first ran. Right. Well, th there is a, there's a common mis uh, misconception about what the Massachusetts State Auditor's Office does. And uh, while we work, indeed, with numbers, all kinds of numbers about spending and personnel and how money is being spent and, and how we track outcomes, uh, we work a lot with numbers, but we don't do financial auditing in the auditor's office. Mm -hmm. uh, we aren't looking at balance sheets. Um, that's the responsibility of the state comptroller's office. What we focus on in the office of the of the state auditor are questions of uh, did you did the agencies or contractors who are doing business with the state did you follow the rules did you put things out to bid are you properly accounting for all of the of the monies are your are your um, processes do they have integrity are you fighting fraud uh, and then we ask. Uh, and how effectively and efficiently are you spending this money? Um, what are the outcomes? Are you really delivering on the promises uh, to the taxpayers and the people you're serving, uh, the promises that you made to them to deliver services effectively and efficiently? So that's the kind of work we do in the, uh, in the auditor's office. Now, sometimes it might be tough because you're in a political environment. Okay, you're an elected state official, and you might be auditing an office or, or making sure it's accountable for another state constitutional officer. Right. Okay, um, you know sometimes in Massachusetts, sometimes you don't see attorney generals, and I'm not talking about this race, but in the past, get to be governor because they did such a good job being attorney general and going after right. fraud and corruption that when they went to the next level, it came back to bite them in a sense, mm -hmm. you're fearless from everything that I've seen so far. <laughs> you're not afraid to 
take on something. Can you give us some of the examples of what you've dealt with in the last four years? And I, I think there's been a real openness, um, you know, in, in government. You know, the state treasurer put the checkbook online, right. and, and 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 the governor as well. And and it's we don't really have bad old days in Brockton, despite what you might read in some of the media. But talk about your, your what you wanted to bring to the office and where you think you are now and where do you want to go? Sure. Uh, the uh, I could take a long time talking about well, this. Well, we got a half an hour, and we'll get a 15-minute queue <laughs> okay. and a 10 and a All 5, right, and we'll be good. So, um, so the I see the office as one of... Um, of being the public's agent for accountability in government, right? So did you spend the money properly? What did we get for it? Those are the questions that I ask. And, uh, and over the past four years, we have identified, in fact, over $400 million worth of broken systems of mismanagement, misspending, and in some cases, uh, fraud uh, as well. And that's, that is a record, frankly, uh, and we, uh, and I'm, I'm proud of that. And some people think, um, and this is kind of sort of implied in your, in your question, some people think that I am doing that in spite of the fact that I'm a Democrat. The reality is I'm doing it because I am a Democrat, because I want people to believe in government. All of the, uh, all of the work of government is wholly dependent upon the trust of the public in order to go forward. If people don't have confidence in it, they're not going to support it in their, with their tax dollars, and they're not going to participate uh, in it in elections and in, other, and in other ways. And so I think it's essential, uh, as a, particularly as a Democrat, that I show that government is capable of self-examination, that there's no part of the government that's, that's off limits, even programs that might be regarded as politically sensitive, uh, that it all has to be accountable to the taxpayers, uh, that it all has to function as well as, as possible. And so that's the, that's the ethos that I've brought to the, to the office. Uh, and I also saw, so that was one of the things that I wanted to accomplish, just to establish um, that firmly in the minds of the public, that there's somebody on their side asking the questions that they would ask if they had the opportunity, and somebody that's holding the rest of government accountable. Um, I knew when I, had, when I was entering the office that, uh, that it needed to be modernized. Um, it, it had been a while since the office had, had turned over. Um, one of the things that you do in order to ensure that you're, uh, you have excellence in auditing is that every three years, every state auditor's office should undergo a peer review. That's when you go to the State Auditors Association. They assemble a team of audit government audit professionals from around the country, and they come in and they look at your practices. Are you are your policies and procedures up to date? Mm -hmm. Are you following the rules when you're doing your auditing? Um, are you demonstrating that you are independent and objective, uh, as well as as well as having uh, evidence to support all of the recommendations that you that you put in an audit? And in 2011, when I took over and had that peer review done, the office pa uh, failed. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't auditing to government standards. So that meant a lot of staff change and of training and of new technologies, of creating a quality assistance uh, unit within our own office, so a kind of internal auditing within the auditor's office to mm -hmm. make sure that everything we do is meeting government standards. Um, and so even as we have been uncovering $400 million worth of broken systems, et cetera, we have also been undergoing a lot of internal change so that we are actually capable of, as I say, modeling the behavior we expect of other agencies. If we're going to hold them to high standards, we have to be held to high standards. And we got our stamp of approval uh, just earlier this year in the spring when we said, okay, three years is up, it's time for another peer review, come on in, tell us what you think. And the office went from failing a peer review to getting the highest possible rating, which is a pass. A pass doesn't sound like it's a high rating, but mm -hmm. there are three levels. You can fail, you can pass with qualifications, which means, oh, you're pretty much in line, but you're, you could use some improvement in these areas. We passed. There were no qualifications. So that's something that we're really proud of and is important if people are going to take our audits seriously, um, which agencies are. Uh, we are finding 
uh, when we go back six months later just to say, okay, so how are you doing implementing all these recommendations? We're find, finding a 90% rate of compliance with our recommendations. And then we'll be back and do full audits in a, in a couple of years. But that's, you know, that, that shows that we're on the right track, that we're helping government work better. And we're also finding that our audit recommendations are being um, picked up and used uh, by the legislature in their efforts to reform a number of agencies. Uh, public Housing Administration uh, reform that they did, welfare reform, uh, changes at the Department of Children and Families, uh, laws that they changed that regulate the special ed collaboratives. All of those things reflect the, the work of the state auditor's office over the past four years. So it's not just audits that kind of sit on somebody's shelf. I mean, we're talking about audits that are making fundamental changes in the way government operates. Got the halfway mark, so I know where we're at. All right. But tell me, did you expect what you got when you got there? When you were running as a candidate, talking about what you were going to do and what your initiatives and plans were, and you got there, did was it what you see is what you get, or were you surprised? And I, I know when you were talking about the staffing, yeah. I mean, I'm familiar, your, your predecessor was there for a while, right. and you did have staff turnover. And of right. course, what is the media going to highlight but anything that's negative, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, we don't do that because we're the positive media, but that's a whole other story. But uh, did, did you expect what you got? Well, I um, had, had not seen, because the office hadn't been peer-reviewed as it should have been, um, I didn't have as the, the depth of, uh, of information that um, I needed so that I would have expected all of the change that I was going to have to make. Um, so, uh, so I, I knew just from being in government and actually having had my agencies audited, uh, some of them at one time or another, um, by the auditor's office. I'd read audits. I actually, some of my staff did auditing of other entities, spending of some of our money at workforce development. So I understood the audit process. Um, but I didn't know how competent the staff was. And so when they point, when the peer review folks said, You've got a lot of people who um, who don't have the proper background, who obviously don't have the skills, uh, and we needed to act on that immediately. That meant that a number of people, um, you know, had to leave the auditor's office so that we could replace them. We we put in hiring standards. There weren't requirements for um, uh, for for qualifications to be hired in the auditor's office that's a pretty basic thing that needed to be instituted didn't know that I'd have to go that you know to mm -hmm. that basic uh, a level but on the on the flip side of that um, I also didn't expect that I was going to find the level of um, of acceptance for my new vision for the office. Um, and the, the, so the staff was very willing to embrace a lot of change. We had to change all our policies and procedures, all of the technology, all the computer systems that we uh, use to do our audits. They had to go un undergo um, you know, large amounts of, uh, of training. We instituted uh, uh, performance evaluations, not just on an annual basis, but after every audit, staff gets evaluated to say, okay, so how, how well did you do? Do you need any help mastering this piece of the audit process? Can we send you off to a, um, a, a program that will help you learn that, learn that better? Um, so those kinds of things were not anticipated, but, they, but doing them and finding people willing to embrace them and willing to, um, to rise to the challenge to be the best professionals they can be, that was really, that was really a wonderful uh, thing. And it, it, it's a source of pride and it's created a lot of great team spirit within the office. And so to have been able to, uh, to set that, those goals, to provide the staff with the resources that they needed, um, uh, either that, that's, been the best, that's been the best part of the job. Mm -hmm. So that's one set of things that I didn't expect that uh, I'd have to confront. The other is that I didn't expect that we would be able to make as much change in government as we've been able to, particularly through working with the legislature. The legislature has been, uh, has been wonderful 
uh, collaborators with us. Uh, they are interested in our audit reports because they aren't just about numbers, um, because they are about how government systems are operating and how we can do it better, how we can better fight fraud in the welfare programs. And so they've, they've embraced uh, recommendations like that, and we've, we've, so we've, we've had a great partnership with the legislature. I would think where you're mentioning things like DCF, welfare, stuff like that, yeah. that's areas that the legislature is interested in, right. and they're you know, being pushed to look into it and reform it, right. and you would be a natural partner. Right, it, it, that's, that's so. I mean, and, and the reason that you're seeing us figure more prominently in some of these big issues of the day, um, there are two reasons for that. One is that uh, we are focusing our efforts on agencies where there is the greatest risk that money will be well spent or greatest risk that, that um, kids won't be protected, just mm -hmm. that things could go off, the, off track. And we have a pretty sophisticated um, objective way of analyzing all of, those, all of those numbers. But then we also want to do things that will help inform the public and help inform the legislature. Uh, and so you know, the Department of, of uh, Transitional Assistance, welfare programs, very much on people's minds, very much uh, a great deal of concern about, what, about the levels of fraud or abuse of those programs. So it made all the sense in the world for us to audit that so that we can and look specifically at their fraud, fraud fighting, not to look at some other aspect of their operation, but to focus on that so that then the legislature could make better decisions. So it's, it's part of a deliberate strategy to use our resources, devote them to areas of greater risk, go much deeper than the audits had been going, audit to government standards, and have a, a more profound impact. Nuts and bolts of the office. How many people work for you? I think you have different offices in different parts right. of the state. Just curious, because I don't think your average person knows that. No, so uh, so the state, it, put it in, in, in perspective, the state budget is $35 billion. The state auditor's budget is about $17 million. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a staff of about 240. Um, half of them are auditors. Others are technology folks. Uh, uh, we also, though, have a Bureau of Special Investigations. They're the ones that take the referrals from the public assistance agencies and go out and do the fraud investigations. So when we do our public assistance fraud um, work, it is with, it's in collaboration with the agencies, Mass Health, um, Department of uh, Transitional Assistance, Early Education and Care for the daycare programs. Uh, so we work with them. And we have identified, um, because we've gotten more sophisticated there, too, about how we use technology and, mm. and look for fraud there, we have uh, greatly increased the amount of um, public assistance fraud that we've detected. Uh, we also, I have a, a, a prosecutor, a former prosecutor, criminal prosecutor now in charge of that office. So, and she has been authorized by the DA's office to, uh, in Suffolk County to prosecute cases herself. So for the first time ever, we're seeing jail time for people who are involved in food stamp trafficking uh, mm -hmm. rings. That had never happened before. So we have a group of people doing that. Uh, we also have a, a group of people that look at uh, the issues of m unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. You know, so state government is uh, you know, regularly changing laws, changing regulations, asking communities to change the way they deliver services. Uh, a lot of changes in, uh, in education, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. So there's a we talk about unfunded mandates when the state says do something, but doesn't provide the money. Um, there's a legal definition of unfunded mandate as well. And when cities and towns think that something legally needs to be funded by the state, then they're not funding it. They come to us for an, an, a legal analysis and a financial analysis. And so we have a group of people that do that um, work and then also do studies of 
mandates that maybe don't fit the legal definition of unfunded mandate, but still that the legislature needs to be informed of so that then they can say, well, maybe we ought to make some changes in this program. So we've, we've um, I just literally today opened up a letter from the Chief of Police Association uh, thanking me for our willingness to do one of these unfunded mandate studies in the area of municipal police training, because the legislature used to provide money for that, and then they stopped. The police chief saying, hey, "You want our offices to be trained, but you're not, and you're telling us what we have, what they have to do, but you're not providing us mm -hmm. with the money." So just, and they said, just the mere thought that you were going to do this. We brought to the legislature, and they provided us with funding. So, <laughs> so we didn't even we didn't even have to do that study. We got the legislature to act. Okay, we got about five minutes left, and I want to make sure I give you time to tell people how they can get involved in your campaign and how to help you. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to continue to sell yourself. Okay, <laughs> well, but um, what, the, the last thing that I wanted to. to basically ask is you, you every state constitutional office has a, a challenge right okay you are a challenge you do have an opponent mm -hmm. I we have another gentleman that hosts shows is probably gonna possibly bring that person on if they call us back but sure. um, what differentiates you from your challenger and why should the voters I'll let you weave this into your closing sure. to to keep you right where you are well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it has really been um, an honor to, to be able to use um, my understanding of state government, uh, the way it works, uh, my insights into how it can work better, uh, and bring that into a leadership role in state government. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to, in a very short period of time, take an office that was failing to meet government standards and and uh, and get the highest possible rating. Um, I would like to address one of the criticisms that my uh, one of my challengers has, has put forward, and that is she has taken note um, of the fact that we are doing fewer audits, and she finds great fault with that. Um, and she's right. There are fewer audits that the office has done. Um, part of our, and she says that the law says that we should you know, be doing more of them, and she's right. But the law also says that we're supposed to audit to government standards. And I had to make a decision whether I was going to try to just do a lot of audits or do audits that really were based on risk, focusing our attention on on the places where things could really go wrong and have the greatest impact, waste the largest amounts of money, um, and do them to government standards. So I had to choose between quality and quantity, and I chose quality. Um, the, the, the kind of proof is in the pudding in terms of the $400 million worth of broken systems and the like that we have been able to, uh, to identify. Uh, so clearly we are getting um, smarter about how we do audits, and I think that we will get uh, uh, increase the number of audits that we do as we in, in, um, in, engage with more technologies. Um, but I think more important is risk-based auditing and, and quality auditing, not just trying to put a lot of paper out the door in order to get to a certain uh, quantity. Uh, so over the past, uh, when I, over the past four years, I think I have shown myself to be a good steward of public resources uh, in the way we've used our, our, uh, our own auditing capacities. I've said I was going to be an agent for accountability. I've done that because I am a Democrat, not in spite of the fact that I'm a Democrat. We've had a major impact on laws and the way we're structuring some government agencies and, uh, and programs. I'm very proud of the, of the fact that I uh, have compiled this record. Um, you know, four years ago I had a plan, I had a vision, now I have a record of, uh, of considerable accomplishment and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing that work on behalf of the taxpayers. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, just a phone number or website for people to get in touch with your campaign. The, the best thing is the website, uh, so that is SuzanneBump.com, www.SuzanneBump.com. Okay, well, thank you very much. You gave me an education. It's always a teachable moment, learn something new. And if we go back to the beginning, it all started at Spelman. It, that's right. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here. Thanks. It's um, been a pleasure. To the voters um, in Brockton and the surrounding area, uh, Brockton Community Access is bringing you this series to meet different candidates so you can be educated, go out, check them out, 
check their website, check their record, but most of all, use your fundamental American right to vote. November 4th is the election date, and Brockton Community Access will continue to make candidates and issues available to all of the voters. Thank you.